Hey, Shane, how's it going? Kyle, I'm doing well, man. I'm wearing a hood down here in Florida. It was 40 degrees this morning when I got up and went a little chilly down here in this part of the country. I'm not used to it. My my blood uh, thinned out, I think, a bit since I left Colorado. So um, it's chilly, man, but it's nice to have a hoodie on. I bet. And, you know, here where I'm at, too, it's a little warmer. It's chilly in the mornings. We go from 40 degrees to about 75 Uh volatile kind of like the markets right now so well why don't we go ahead and step into it and for anyone watching today's october 20th and please like subscribe and submit some questions too love to hear from you and happy to address them in future calls so shane to start off here's the spy we've kind of talked about our levels and it looks like more of the same uh just kind of down here in this lower level I think the risk is a little more to the upside right now based on no economics, just simply in the short term. You could see a little bit of a bounce, but the trend clearly is down. What are you seeing? Uh, yeah, I just see I see good consolidation down here at the lows of the year, which is, uh, to me, I think pretty bearish. Um, I think the longer we hang out around here, the more likely we are to actually see a, a nice big drop back down to that 340 level or maybe even lower, depending on how long we spend consolidating um, around here. But, you know, market's still below where it closed back at the end of 2020. So we've fully erased all of the gains, uh, which were, you know, absurd and silly for <laughs> 2021. Again, 2021 was the year of GameStop and AMC. Um so that's what you had to own to beat the market last year. And uh, profitless tech just rallied all year. And, you know, we'll get to the QQQ chart. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, 2021 has been erased and we're, we're sitting here consolidating around the lows. Nobody's really buying. I don't see a ton of volume coming in. Um, I think uh, I think the market's just kind of consolidating here as we wait for the Fed to hike rates once more on uh, November 2nd. So we got two weeks from yesterday until the next rate hike. I think the only question is how much they'll hike by. And uh, we'll we'll see when the time comes. But rates are going up. Uh, that means discount rates. Uh, future cash flows are going to be discounted at a higher rate, which is going to bring down present values. And so it's kind of the story of the year. Higher rates are going to lead to lower asset prices, and uh, that'll be good for inflation at some point, but we got a long ways to go. So, um, so yeah, I'm not optimistic that we'll see much <laughs> upside. You know, could the market bounce up to the 50-day moving average? Sure, why not? Uh, could it even bounce up to the 200-day moving average? Of course it can, um, but that's not my base case. My base case is we'll continue to consolidate around here. And then uh, ultimately move lower, set a new low for the year. And I agree with that. I think this is going to take time. And we've seen this pattern. So, you know, a lower high, a lower high. We're down here. And it's totally reasonable that we could see a run up here on SPY to 410. And that's right where the 200 day is. Maybe it's even just the 50 at about 390. And then start to roll over. Um I think people forget sometimes bear markets take time. It's not just going to drop 50% overnight and be great. It's going to just churn and burn and work its way down. Yeah. I, I drew a second kind of downtrend line there because we've, we've sort of broken through the, uh, you know, the, the first thicker purple line there. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of bouncing above that now. So maybe we'll get up to the next purple down trending line. Um, it did that for one day, you know, a month or so ago, middle of September, and then just dropped hard again. I don't know what the data was that day. It's probably, probably the Fed doing something or CPI print or something along those lines. And, uh, and so, you know, I don't, I just don't, I don't see much upside. I think there's too much overhead resistance and too much data coming our way. That's not going to be good. And um, markets given back, you know, pretty much all of its gains for the day so far, actually. Yeah. S&P 500 futures just went negative. Uh, NASDAQ futures about to go negative for the day today. So that green candle you see right there uh, <laughs> has turned red for the SPY and uh, is about to turn red for the Qs as we're talking. So, um, yep, nothing to get too bullish about here. Um, I did put one bullish slide in the chart later, but uh, – the good old Fibonacci retracements. <laughs> Kyle, why don't you uh, explain just briefly what a Fibonacci retracement is? Yeah, so 
bit of a history lesson. Uh, Indian traders or merchants came up with this in 400 BC, so before charts existed. But really, it's a mathematical sequence that plays out through life. And I'm no uh, math major, so I can't get too detailed on this. But what you really have that I measured here is here's the rally that was the COVID rally. And what a Fibonacci measurement does is it takes that rally and then there's natural levels where you would expect for a bounce to happen. So the first one is down here, it's about 38% down. The next right here is a 50% retracement. And this is important for a couple of reasons. One, you can see it did hit that 50% retracement level and bounce. The other one is oddly everyone that didn't get in here when COVID happened, complained all the way up. I wish I would have bought, I wish I would have bought. And now you're getting a 50% discount on something you really wanted. And that's a level where you would talk about investors that are all cash right now. You know, having some get or some cash get to work here, not too bad. I mean, if you look at it like a supermarket, it's really 50% off of the price. So not a bad spot. It doesn't mean this is the bottom, but mathematically not a bad place below to work and then once you get down into this range below the 60 percent retracement that's where people oftentimes look at stocks like zoom peloton and they say well it's down about 80 percent what a deal i'll make all kinds of money but really that's the signal at that point then it's like okay this is not a healthy trend uh, i should probably look for something else so i just put this up to illustrate that point is that you know we had that big rally and it's natural that it would have about a 50% retracement. Where it goes from here, I don't know, but that's a level where you could put some money to work and it makes sense to do so just based on the math. Yeah, it's only weird if it doesn't work, but I you know, I would also add like I you, you briefly kind of touched on it, but um the Fibonacci is it's also called the golden ratio. So for those of you out there who have never heard of this, maybe go google the golden ratio. Um, there's a couple other names for it uh, in, in various parts of the world uh, or, or parts of, I guess, its uses. But I mean, the, uh, the Fibonacci ratios um, that we're talking about. So, you know, from from bottom to top is 100 percent move. Right. And then from there, you have different percentages of retracement or ratios of retracement. Um, and it goes beyond 100 percent. You know, there's 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 all types of we could get it we could get real deep and spend a whole hour mm -hmm. talking about this but what i think is super interesting is like it it applies to stock charts in the exact same way that it applies to pine cones for example in nature like how pine cones are constructed and the ratio of you know one i guess i don't even know what pine cones are what those little things inside of the pine cones are referred to but the spacing of them it, it re refers to palm trees right and the spacing of the leaves and so it's it's just it's the golden ratio um it applies to leonardo da vinci artwork even um and, and so snail if you go, shells snail yeah shells just, are always the one that you'll see <laughs> yeah and so when i play uh when i play uh pubg the video game pubg uh, which I, I haven't gotten to play um very often lately because i just been too busy I haven't played much video games these days but uh my name on um on PUBG is Mr. Fibonacci. So if anybody out there <laughs> plays PUBG and you want to look me up, uh, you can find me as Mr. Fibonacci. So um, yeah, pretty pretty interesting trading tool and pretty perfect tag of the 50% retracement here that you're pointing out. So mm -hmm. good call. And then the next one here, NASDAQ, nothing new. So we talked about this last time. We've just been in this downward trending channel and could certainly see a break above it. Wouldn't surprise me one bit, but clearly still going down. Nothing exciting on this one. Yeah, that green candle again that you see there for today is just about to turn red. So looks like we're going to stay in the channel. If you know, if this is a, if this is a top, if it's running into resistance at the top of that channel, and we drop from here, um, the pre-COVID highs are a chip shot away. That's that's not very much of a move down to 237 from here. So uh, no reason it has to stop going down at 237. Uh, I'm watching the 10-year Treasury yield ramp higher right now. We're at 4.2%. Uh, so just over 4.2%. The higher that rate goes, uh, the lower Qs is going to go. That's just all there is to it. So until uh, interest rates stop going up, 
by as much as they're going up, uh, Q's is in, in, in jail. It's in, it's in the doghouse, uh, out behind the woodshed, lots of analogies <laughs> we could use, but this is, it's not a good situation and there's really nothing to get bullish about, even if you see a short term bounce. So, no. um, next slide, I'll show you just a little bit of a zoomed in view. I mean, that's an aggressive down channel. It's, it's pointing down at a, at a higher angle than the prior down channel. Um, and I mean, who knows, you know, by the end of the day, we could, we could blast right out of it and head back towards the 50 day moving average. Anything's possible here. Um, but my base case is, is that we stay in the channel and keep trending down until interest rates stop going up. And, uh, that's not going to happen with the fed raising rates two weeks from now. Everybody knows the rates going up. Yep. So, and we've seen whenever the fed has had their meetings lately or a CPI print, the market has just gotten clobbered and, not saying that's going to happen every time, but those have been the catalysts to really push it down. So we'll see on that one. But you know, Shane, you highlighted the stock that everybody owns, Apple. Everybody and still owns Apple. It's It's been holding in here. We've talked about this. I think it might have been one of our first videos, this 138 level that spans yep. all the way back here. It's continued to hold. It went down through it right here briefly still probably kind of watching that level on my end and if we ever got down to this gap that'd be a wonderful buying opportunity i think you could come through that quick maybe find some support what are you seeing yeah i mean i it's there's a number of things that i see here um first is the the two downtrending purple lines are like and they're perfectly symmetrical you know the one mm -hmm. from like march to july or whatever yeah that one there and then now the one that we're in um and so the purple line that you see the vertical purple line there uh or pink i don't know what color that is magenta <laughs> uh that's earnings so earnings are coming up here what, is that next week or is that later yeah that's next week so next a week from today we'll have earnings um and, and Apple was just out a couple of days ago saying that they slowed their iPhone 14 production. Um, so I don't know. I don't see much of a breakout happening before earnings. And if earnings are bad, I could see this thing drop into a fresh low below 129.04. And, you know, for all you people out there who think you'll never get a chance to buy Apple at 100 again, I wouldn't discount it because there's a gap down there at 100. And uh, it could easily dip below 100 just to fill that gap. Um from way back in August of 2020. Um, so there's no reason that Apple can't drop there. I mean, this is, we call them the generals and this is the last general to die on the field. This is where all the hedge funds are hanging out. This is where all the retail investors are like, well, I can't go wrong buying Apple. I'm not gonna sell my Apple. We might be in a bear market and Apple might be down 20% from its highs, but I'm not gonna sell my Apple. I'm gonna hold it forever. Well. So eventually people will sell this thing if it gets bad enough and uh, the hedge funds will be forced sellers if they get enough redemptions. Um, there, There's a lot of things that can go wrong with this stock and not because Apple's a bad company or that it's going out of business or that people don't want iPhones anymore or watches. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of all of Apple products. I just bought a new, uh, or my, my daughter just bought a new iPhone 14 the other day. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to dog Apple, but I'm saying this is the only reason that the Qs uh, is not down a lot more. I mean, this is the biggest constituent in both Qs and SPY. If this thing drops to a fresh low, those indexes are both going to drop to a fresh low. There's almost no doubt about it. So um, if Apple gives it up here, breaks 129 lows on bad earnings, I mean, it doesn't have to drop to 100, but it's totally reasonable to think that it would. And and think about that from 129 down to a hundred, you're talking about, you know, a 29% loss, essentially, you know, just mm -hmm. using some fuzzy math. So um, I guess 29 divided by 129 is closer to 22% lower if you want to do the arithmetic properly, but um, that's not going to be a picnic for anybody. And that could take the indexes way lower through the end of the year. So um, look out for Apple to break down. Yeah. And the big thing there, again, doesn't mean Apple's a bad company, but when the timing is off and the markets are not going in favor of, you know, being bullish, you can see really good companies get taken to the woodshed and go down 30%. So mm -hmm. got to manage risk. Yep. You got it. And then Tesla, this thing has just been in this, I don't know what that is, a giant pennant formation, but I would say it's more of just 
purely a, a bearish trend. We're back down at the bottom here. Yeah, we could go below that. I think it's going to take some real momentum to get there. Odds are we just keep kind of bouncing around in this channel and then working our way lower. What are your thoughts, Shane? Well, my thoughts are that Elon Musk is a lying sack of crap. <laughs> um, and this stock deserves to be much, much lower than where it is. Uh, they released earnings last night. In one breath, they said they missed their deliveries and lowered their deliveries for the full year. In the next breath, they said they expected to grow by 50% a year um, for the rest of the, for, I don't know, for the foreseeable future, essentially. Um, Elon Musk basically said all the craziest things you could imagine someone saying who really wants the stock to go up because he needs to sell some of this stock in order to pay for his Twitter transaction that he was forced into uh completing so I, i'm looking actually for some for some notes oh he said tesla's board has been kicking around the idea of repurchasing shares uh it's likely that the company will pursue a meaningful buyback he floated the idea of a buyback of around 5 billion to 10 billion in 2023 now why in the world would you know well let me back up meanwhile He's the largest shareholder of Tesla, and he sold more than 15 billion of stock so far this year. So why would he be talking about buying shares back, the company buying shares back, while he's personally selling billions of dollars? I'll tell you why. Because he needs to sell them to someone, and there's not very <laughs> many people with 5 to $10 billion to buy those shares from him that he knows are going to probably go down. So it's all smoke and mirrors, if you ask me. Um, the company said they expect to sell every car that we can make for as far into the future as we can see. So if that's the case, why would you buy back shares versus investing more in capacity to produce cars? That That is not a good business decision at all. That's a good decision for a person to sell a whole bunch of stock to the company. Um, it, it doesn't make any economic sense at all, though. It's just kind of like... Like what in the world? And, uh, you know, he's got a bunch of his shares on loan too. Um, so I bet you the interest rate that he's paying to the banks that he borrowed against his shares, I bet you that's a floating rate. So he's now paying more interest on those. So he'd probably like to sh sell some more shares to get some of those notes paid down. I mean, to me, I, you know, Tesla is so expensive. It's so overpriced. It produces cars. You know, and if it wants, it, it can earn the kind of margins that it put up this year. I think it was like a 15% profit margin or something like that for the quarter. It can do that while it's producing relatively very few niche luxury type cars. But if it wants to become ubiquitous and, you know, a mass producer of vehicles for the common person, their margins are going to get smoked. And as those margins compress down to what, you know, Ford and Toyota and other car makers actually, you know, generate in profits, uh, its multiples should come down by a lot. Like right now, Tesla trades at 80 times earnings and 11.45 times sales. And yeah, it's growing, but it's not growing fast enough to warrant that, especially with margins being compressed. So um, I don't, you know, I don't know. They've expanded margins and they've done, you know, they've done a lot of great things and I'm, I I can't knock them uh, for everything, but I just think Musk is mostly a salesman. He's, he's, his main product that he sells is stock in Tesla, sells a lot more of that than he sells in vehicles and he gets paid way too much to do it. So I would, I would love to short this stock here. I think it can easily go a lot lower. I mean, the pre COVID highs for this stock are about $60 a share. So that's a yeah. long way down. <laughs> and if this thing breaks down, it's going to take the indexes with it too. So yep. anyway, it, it looks like crap and uh, I would not want to be in it. <laughs> and then this one, just going back to the 60 40 portfolio idea, the you know safe haven, it's going to work out. Just hold on long term. It's down 23% and your bonds are going with your stocks just not a not a good way to go i know historical correlations are nice and they have worked but the history does not have to repeat and in this case it is falling apart yeah it's called regime change we're no longer in a 30-year bull market for bonds so bonds are not going to automatically help bail out stocks um where we probably entered a 30-year bear market in bonds and uh i probably wouldn't want to own a lot of bonds um especially with the 
knowing that rates are going to go up. There will be a time to buy some bonds, but I probably wouldn't buy a bond fund like LQD. Um, I would just buy the individual bonds that I want to buy and hold them till maturity. That way I can't lose any money. Mm -hmm. So um, so there's a much better way to do it. If you're still in a 60-40 portfolio, you know, recommended by your financial advisor at Edward Jones or Northwestern Mutual or wherever you might be. Uh, it's a very common pie chart prison type portfolio to be stuck in with your advisor telling you not to worry, it'll all come back. Well, it might be 30 years before these bonds come back. So I, I would not count on that. And uh, there's a better way. So give Kyle a call <laughs> if uh, you want to hear about that. Yep. So then next one, crude oil, it was looking so constructed or constructive. So we had this rally up. We got back above the 50 day moving average back tested. You know, I was looking at it today and I honestly, I was thinking about going long right here or that was yesterday. Now, I don't know, Shane, what you show at the moment, it could change by the end of the day, but kind of looks like a rejection to me of the 50 day. Yeah, that's what I put the little yellow arrow there. Um, looks like a perfect tag of the 50 day moving average and then a total rejection. So um, the candle has turned green since we got on the call, but it still looks about the same oil trading at 85 uh, 12. I think it's especially funny on the heels of Mr. Biden uh, releasing more oil from the strategic reserve right ahead of midterm elections, trying to bring gas prices down and oil prices <laughs> down. And yesterday, you know, oil went up a whole bunch just just despite, um, you know, the government's efforts. So uh, I don't I don't think those SPR releases are a good idea. I don't think they actually impact the price immediately enough. And uh, it's shameful to try and, you know, try and mess with elections that way but every politician does it it's not just democrats it's republicans it's everybody in between if they can manipulate some data or you know pull on some lever to kind of help their position in an upcoming election every politician in the world would do it which is basically why anybody who wants to be a politician should be not allowed to and only <laughs> people who don't want anything to do with politics should be allowed to be holding public office yeah and a politician should definitely not be a career choice. It should be a public service that you do for a, uh, a certain term, and then you go back to work in the real world. But I digress. That's not what we're here to talk about. Yeah. And the big takeaway here, I don't know if you have the XLE chart. Oh, there you go. Yep. This, there. So they have not gotten the memo. Um, we're in a bear market, <laughs> and XLE does not care. Uh, it's this is just a textbook breakout. You've got a nice consolidation. I love it. Yeah, well, it's running into that 8515 level, which was the high back in August. So it might cool down here. I personally, uh, well, not personally, but I guess professionally in Elevate portfolios, we've been long XLE for a long time. We're up a lot. And uh, what I've been doing over the past couple of weeks, I'm not sure if I did this before last week's call or since last week's call, but we sold some covered calls on it up around 95 um, that expire in November. So uh, I don't think we'll get above 95 by November. Uh, even if we do, I think we'll drop a little bit um, sometime between now and then, and I'll be able to buy those calls back for a nice profit. Uh, but worst case scenario, we have to sell some shares at 95 in November. And I think we bought them at like 50. So you know, whatever, no big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe even lower than that. Maybe, maybe we bought them even, I don't know. Don't remember where, but I know <laughs> we own some and I know we sold some covered calls against part of our position. And uh, that's what you do. I mean, you look at a chart like this, it looks bullish. You want to own it. You want to stay long, but you know, it might, it might run out of gas. I mean, it's had positive momentum since the beginning of October. I mean, why it, it could easily drop back to the 50 or 200 day moving average. And if I sold those covered calls at 95, for example, say I sold them for a dollar, I'll be able to buy them back for 50 cents or 40 cents or 30 cents and just pocket the difference. So that's why we sell covered calls. Um, worst case scenario, we have to sell for a profit. Yeah. You know, we get paid to sell for a profit. It's, you gotta, if you don't know how to sell covered calls, again, call Kyle. Uh, <laughs> we'll go through it. We do that for clients and uh, we're you know, we're, we're pretty good at it. We don't, we don't normally get forced to sell our shares normally, you know, very high percentage of the time. Uh, we just buy the calls back for a profit and we never actually get forced to sell. Occasionally we do, we are forced to sell. Um, but we always, if, if we're forced to sell, it's always for a profit. So, yep. uh, covered calls are like our bread and butter. And the big thing here, just at the end of the day, simply, if you're new to investing, sometimes the easiest thing you got to do is 
look at a chart and if it's going higher and you want your account to go higher, you buy that stock. So classic example right here. Yeah. So Bitcoin and I know crypto, you know, we could talk about all the coins right now. There's just not a whole lot of reason to, I think, you know, you're not seeing a bunch of bullish movement. Here we are. We talked about this before. You had this tag of the, you know, 50 day and the downtrend resistance line. That, that was the first here. that was the first breakout of that downtrend resistance though since November of last year. So that was the first time we traded above that purple line in almost a year. And since then, we've stayed above it. So it came back and back tested, if you want to call it that. It, it rode that purple line down a little, even dropped below, you know, on that on that big wick there. Uh for one day, but then jumped right back above it. So we're above the downtrend line now. Um, still below the 50 day moving average, still not bullish on this yet, uh, but I'm constructive that it is consolidating. And again, as, as long as it holds above the 17.5 area and just consolidates for a little bit, the longer it does that, the longer it kind of stays flat, but above 17.5, the more likely I think we will um, see you know, a, a big, a big jump one day, we'll all wake up in the morning and Bitcoin will be up 15 or 20% yep. and uh, we'll be off to the races. So, you know, I think you can, I think you can buy it here if you, you know, if you're getting antsy and you don't want to wait any longer, I think you can buy it here, you know, you know a partial position, a 10% position, a, you know, 10% of your target, uh, maybe even 25% of your target position size here, and then put your stop at around 17,500. Um, and then see what happens. But, uh, I, you know, anything can happen, you know, especially in Bitcoin crypto world. Um, but I, this is the most constructive I've been for a while. So one that I think uh, you can keep on the watch list. And um, for the first time in a while, it's, it's, it, it might go your way. Yeah. And the big thing here, you kind of mentioned it, but, you know, a blind squirrel can be profitable in the markets if you manage the positions appropriately. So this is one where, Hey, it's down here. You don't really have high conviction. You know, start buying pieces of it. If you're wrong, you don't lose a whole lot, and it keeps that risk small. And then once it confirms, goes higher, gives you another opportunity. Then you can get aggressive and get in. If you did that on every stock or investment out there, you'd probably do pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then here is just again our most bullish chart we know of. This is the ten-year Treasury. Uh, this is not good for anything. <laughs> other than no. combating inflation, I guess. Yep. But man, that is, if this was a penny stock, I'd be you know trying to short it up here, but this is a very different animal. So you certainly wouldn't want to try and time it like that, but. Yeah. And it's going higher as we speak. We're at 4.209 now and the NASDAQ is down 20 basis points for the day. S&P 500 futures are down a half a percent for the day. Uh, dollar is still down slightly, but rallying off the lows and uh dude this is just it's a disaster for all other asset prices that the 10 years this high and the dollar is going to go higher with it and it's going to go even higher two weeks from now uh when the fed raises rates again so look out below on everything else yep. if i could just go buy this chart i would i would buy this chart you know <laughs> it'd be great but it doesn't work that way nope so what it does do though, it impacts one thing right here and that's the yield curve inversion. And you know, regardless of what the level is right now, it has broken below the dot-com era and it just looks atrocious. And what it looks like, you know, I think something to hit on is, well, if the long-term money is cheaper to borrow than the short-term money, what does that mean? Well, it means nobody wants to borrow long-term. No, people aren't investing those are things that you know spill over into the economy and as you can see you get a dip recession you get a dip recession yeah those white areas are recessions i did i did take the time to go add those so every, every white area that you see there which this is a this chart goes back to like the mid 1980s like 1985 or something so those those white boxes even though they don't look like much um you know, the one the one in 2008 area was like a year and a half long worth of recession. You know, the 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 most recent one during COVID was only a two month recession. It covered March and April. Um, so, I mean, some of those are you know, a little longer. And uh, the it seems to me that the the further 
the yield curve inverts. So the lower this goes, the more negative it goes, and the longer it stays there, the worse the recession can easily be. So, um, I, you know, eventually this will uninvert. That doesn't mean we're all clear. That just means we're closer to the recession starting. Probably, I personally think we're already in a recession. I think the first two quarters, or the most recent two quarters, uh, yeah, first two quarters of the year. You know, both had negative GDP. I don't care how many jobs there got created in the economy. Two negative quarters of GDP is a recession in my world. And um, even if we get a positive quarter here in third quarter, which it looks like we will, I don't know how that's possible, but I don't think that means we're not in a recession anymore. Um, I think we're clearly in a recession. Uh, I don't think the economy is anything good going on. And I mean, this is the 10 minus the two year the 10 year minus the six month is inverted. Uh, maybe not six months, <laughs> but what, 10 year minus one year, 10 year minus nine month is certainly inverted because we're buying, you know, nine month treasuries uh, for our clients and we are getting a higher yield than the previous chart showed for the 10 year, which is 4%. We've been getting more than 4% for like more than a month now. So in six and nine month treasuries, I mean, so why would you borrow money why would you loan somebody money for 10 years when you get the same rate of return loaning it to them for nine months? You wouldn't. Right. And why would you buy a bank stock in this situation? I mean, bank stocks make money on a positive yield curve, right? They they pay the short-term interest rate and they earn the long-term interest rate. So right now, all banks are losing money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh well... I shouldn't, it's not quite that simple because most banks haven't actually raised their checking account interest rates or savings account interest rates to reflect reality. Right. Um, but I still don't, I'm, you know, I don't want to be long bank stocks uh, with an inverted yield curve and an economy heading into recession. That's just the last thing in the world I would want to own. Yep. And, you know, back to this, just the US dollar, which is high because of the high interest rates just keeps ripping and this is not good for the stock market. So I'd like to see some relief in this chart before I got bullish on stocks. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that relief is not coming. So the whole re the whole way to fight inflation is by strengthening the dollar. That's it. That's how it's going to work. So the Fed's goal is to make this go up. Uh, as this goes up, um, because they're raising interest rates, the demand for dollars will go up so that they can take those dollars and invest them at the 10 year US treasury rate. So it's a vicious cycle. It's not gonna end anytime soon. It's not gonna end until inflation gets crushed. And there's a long way to go before inflation is back to where the Fed wants it. So um, they're as they keep raising rates, they're gonna keep putting a bid under this dollar and it's just gonna keep going higher. So next week, uh, when we talk, I fully expect this to have broken out above the 114 level or at least going back towards it mm -hmm. um, it may not happen that fast i mean you know nothing has to happen that quickly but certainly in two weeks when the fed raises rates again you would think people will try to front run that because we all know they're going to raise rates so if you're buying dollars you probably want to buy them now rather than wait until after november 2nd so my guess is that we're going to see a new high on the dollar sometime very soon and uh as you mentioned before that's not good for the prices of anything yep and then here is a big one, Shane. You brought this chart to my attention, Doctor Copper. So, yeah. Copper right now, you know, it sold off. Uh, that's kind of start a year in April, just got clobbered, forming a classic wedge pattern right here. And I don't see support until you get down here at the bottom of COVID, and that leaves about forty-two percent downside. And this is a very big indicator of the you know overall growth of the economy. And right now, it's pointing to a recession. I mean, no demand, you know, copper for anyone who doesn't know is used a lot in construction and other industrial products. And yeah. if demand is down, that usually means they're not building a whole lot and the economy is slow. Yeah, this this is <laughs> this does not foretell a good future. If it breaks down out of this wedge, look out. Uh, it's going to take the market with it. Usually leaves the market by a bit, so doesn't mean that it'll happen overnight in the in the stock market as the copper markets roll over. Um, and certainly, copper markets don't have to roll over. We could get a headline, you know, a week from now or later today that sends copper racing back towards its 200-day moving average. But for right now. Um, this, this, nothing nothing looks bullish here. This this looks like uh, it could get a lot uglier and take the, the stock market down with it. So um, yeah, who knows? Who knows if it'll go all the way down to 196 either, but 
um, the lower it goes, the lower the market will go. So kind of all things point to uh, to a lower stock market from here. Yep. And just another little thing to point out, the 50-day moving average, look how the price action has stayed under it that whole time. Again, just not a positive signal on that. Yep. And, you know, mortgages, we don't need to beat this one to death, but every time we're bringing this up in our calls, it's getting real expensive to buy a house and you better believe that the price of that house better come down to compensate because people will not be borrowing, you know, almost 7% to go beyond their means on spending. No, and people don't even want to move now because they got if they move out and they sell their current house, they're going to have to go get a mortgage at one of these rates. So, I mm -hmm. mean, not only is it going to bring, bring prices down, but it might take houses off of the market completely, which will kind of offset some of those price drops. But, I mean, that also decreases demand for the new house. So, th there's a lot going on in the, in the housing markets. But um, as this pushes 7%, I mean, we haven't seen 7% decade decades you know it's a long time and uh again fed's gonna raise rates again in two weeks so chances are next time we talk it will be over seven percent yep and then changes our classic chart we always bring up in the context of a bear market this is 08 you will have some pretty significant rallies in there but that does not mean the bottom is in that's right not much more to say on that if you want no. more on that, you can look at some of our prior calls where we went more in depth. But yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time on this either. Um, mm -hmm. we, we we hit it pretty heavily last week. So if you have questions on what you're seeing here, uh, you can go check out last week's uh, Elevate chat. But uh, you know, this is kind of the best case scenario. This assumes that starting next month, or really this month, which will be reported uh, in early November, that CPI, the prices of goods and services in the economy, starts falling by 10, 10 basis points per month. Uh, if it does that consistently um, from now until December 2023, the CPI column is kind of is is what we will get, and. Um, Ultimately, the two big takeaways is that in this situation, the earliest time that we expect or that I expect, I won't speak for you, Kyle, um, the earliest point at which I expect the real Fed funds rate to go positive, meaning that interest rates are higher than inflation, uh, would be February of 2023. That's when the Fed could stop hiking interest rates like they're going to do in two weeks. Uh, that's pretty much the best case scenario that I can see. The big problem with this best case scenario is that the Fed doesn't want CPI to actually fall on a year over year basis. They may want it to fall on a month over month basis, but their goal is 2% annual inflation, not negative uh, <laughs> inflation, because if if prices don't consistently rise by a small amount in the economy, people are incentivized uh, to to not spend or disincentivize from spending because that TV will cost less next month and the car will cost less next month and the house might cost less next month. So the spending kind of stops. Yep. So we don't want to see a, a year over year CPI negative number, but I think all of us uh, <laughs> would like to see prices come down a little bit on a month over month basis, at least for a little while to stop the Fed from raising rates and to kind of slow prices from uh, their their meteoric rise that we've seen. So yep. anyway, February is the earliest data which I can see that happening, which means the last Fed hike would be in January. And that is the best case scenario. I think it's pretty unlikely that that will happen. Um, but we'll see. Yep. And all I'll say on this, just because we expect rates to even out around that time, that doesn't mean that's the timing for the bottom in the market. It just means that then you might have a little better environment for it. So, you know, Shane, I like this one. You brought this up, but when I look at this, it's kind of telling you when everybody's down here, it's panic euphoria. So panic down here. I'd like to buy when there's panic. You know, everybody always wants to buy when there's euphoria and it doesn't really work out for the retail investor. So we're down here. I guess my takeaway is that if there was a time to put a little money to work, kind of like I was talking about with the Fibonacci levels, yeah, it's probably a, a relatively good time, uh, but doesn't mean there's a bottom right now. Shane, do you have anything to add to that? No, it's. I mean, it's pretty basic. I think you hit it. The the big deal here, though, is that it takes about a year for that return to be positive uh, or that positive. So it doesn't mean we can't go a little lower first. You know, you might not want to look at the things you buy a month from now or six weeks from now or two weeks from now, but one year from now, 
pretty good odds that the market's going to be higher than where it is today. Doesn't mean it's not going to go a whole lot lower first. So uh, don't put all your cash to work on on one thing mm -hmm. like this. I mean, we have one bullish chart out of however many however many slides we got in this deck today. So uh, bullish is not our base case, but there's always reasons to be bullish and there's always reasons to be bearish. So, yep. um, yeah. So we're going to try and wrap up here quickly, but if you want to just hang out, I'm going to read, read this, maybe pause the video. Oh, you went, you went too fast, man. You went oh. too fast. Back, back it up, back it up. Can you back it up? There you go. There. So if you read this quote, if you got to pause it, fine. But um, basically what it says is that, you know, people look at stocks and they'll say, I'm going to buy because we're stocks have gone down in price so much. So they must, stocks must be on sale here. But most people don't have any idea how to value a stock. And most people just want to do nothing and hold on. And, and they, they think they can, they can, take the pain, right? It says, yes, they feel pain, but they're hoping that the pain will end without the necessity of doing anything. But the real problem is that they have no concept of value. Uh, they're looking at how far prices have declined and have decided that that must be enough. So they go buy a bunch of stuff, which is why you get bear market rallies. Well, Kyle, if you hit the down arrow there, you'll see that this is not a quote from today. This is a quote from March 15th of 2001. Now you went one too far. Oh. Um, so this is, this it is very parallel to today. And John Hussman's the man. You should go Google his commentary and subscribe to it. Um, read it every time it comes out. It's very thorough. Um, and this guy's been at it a long while. Obviously, he, he had this to say back in 2001. So fast forward 20 years, he's still doing the same thing. And he's probably learned a few things along the way. So in his commentary earlier this week, he posted this. And um, I thought it was interesting that he said this on March 15th, 01. So go ahead, Kyle. Uh, you can do one more. So on March 15th of 2001, the market was already down 25% from its highs. And he was talking about how people have no idea what they're doing, trying to buy this dip uh, because they think things are cheap. Well, they, things were not cheap. And you can see from there, they got a little rally in the market all the way back up to the 200 day moving average and through the 50 um, before ultimately the market dropped another 33% in the, in the subsequent months. So, you know, when he when he originally wrote this quote on March 15th of 2001, they weren't even halfway to the bottom. Um, and that's kind of what I feel like today is people look at the stock market and they say, gosh, things are down so much. Tesla's down 50 percent from its highs. It's got to be a good buy here, right? No, it's not. I mean, it's it trades at 90 times earnings. We, we just talked about that earlier. And there's a whole host of other stocks in the market that are just as expensive, if not more so than Tesla. And they're down 60 or 70%. So the market can go a ton lower from here. It has before. We've been in this situation before. And the guys who were managing money back in 2001, when I personally was graduating high school, um, they know. They know these things. And so don't get all excited the next time a bear market rally happens because we ultimately probably have a lot lower to go. If not, things are just crazy expensive right now. There's there's a reason why you don't see Warren Buffett out there buying entire companies. It's because they're still too expensive despite, despite being down 50% or more. Yep. So anyway, there's there's not a lot of value out there and this market could easily have much further to fall. Well, Shane it looks like this is different. So this contradicts that statement. T tell us about this one from the Babylon B. Or I this guess one's actually, B. this one's not the B. Yeah, so there's <laughs> the B or not the B. That is the question. Uh, and not the B is actually uh, real news. It's not satire. So this is, this is real. Um, Mr. Biden did say the economy is strong as hell while eating his ice cream cone. And literally the same day, Bloomberg headline says forecast for U.S. recession within one year hits 100 <laughs> percent so we're not the only ones calling for a recession within one year um but our president doesn't seem to uh doesn't seem to be paying attention um and as it says at the very bottom those paying attention know that the u.s has actually already been in a recession for several months which is my personal opinion so or i, I guess my professional opinion um because i do do this for a living so <laughs> anyway the, the funny thing is is that the satire site uh, the Babylon Bee. I think we get the same picture on the next slide. 
Yep, different iteration of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, spokesperson for hell rejects Biden's claim that the U.S. economy is strong as hell. Uh, <laughs> even a, even as a Christian, uh, I I thought that one was pretty funny. So, yep. So, well, Shane, I think that wraps it up. And you know, thanks again for taking the time this week. And it's always fun to walk through these slides and kind of see the trend of everything. But still, right now, just try and guide everyone. But it's just we're in a bear market so it's going to be volatile it's trending down and makes for a lot of fun every week in this call so thanks my pleasure dude thanks for hosting and uh we'll see you next week sounds good you have a good day see ya